So, we've gone through this whole list of spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We've gotten to the end of it. But in Romans chapter 12, Paul has another letter that he's written to another group of people, and he has the same conversation. He says, these are things that you want to see happening in your life and in your church. You want to see people speaking the word of God. You want to see miracles. You want to see this sort of stuff. The interesting thing about it is that the lists are not identical. They overlap in some ways. Some things are shared, like the gift of prophecy in both lists. But the gift of service, which we're going to talk about today, is the second in Paul's list in Romans, but it's not included in the list in 1 Corinthians. Why is that important? Because it shows that what the Bible gives us as lists are not meant to be exhaustive, limiting things. Like, here are the eight options for how God's going to work. Which of the eight are you? Here are the 12 things that God is capable of doing. No. God does all sorts of things. I even think sometimes about music. It's something that's near and dear to my heart, but something that we all enjoy, we gather in. I think there's something called a spiritual gift of music. Doesn't music be a way that like, God communicates to, sometimes to us or humbles us or causes us to rejoice? God certainly uses it. And there are some times where we're listening to music where it has no spiritual component. It's just a song. But there's other times where something's happening. I've been singing a song sometimes where I've sung that song a hundred times and now I sang it the hundred and first time and tears come into my eyes because something's different. God's like saying something or showing up in some way. So the fact that we have multiple lists and they're not identical, I want that to be an opening, a freedom statement. God is not looking to limit himself to a few certain things. He's looking to do lots of things and these are some of maybe the key ways that he works or maybe even the most common, maybe even the most important but they're not meant to be exhaustive. So we find ourselves in Romans, and I think there's five in this list. So it's a little bit of a shorter list. We're going to add this to our conversation about spiritual gifts and go through these one by one. Probably take us through some of the Sundays in the summer, and we'll head off into the fall and uh, see where God takes our, our teaching at that point. But this is such a perfect Sunday to be talking about service because it's Memorial Day weekend. So we're talking about the service of men and women who are willing to put their lives on the line. Obviously, as Christians, we gather every time we get together, even someone's home or in church, because Jesus died for us and sacrificed for us. So there's a great theme here that I hope we can take um, forward. You know, adopt as this weekend's kind of theme song, the message that this weekend should be communicating to us. What does it look like to serve? What does it look like for us to really look like God. Now, I was mentioning to you earlier that um, sometimes we serve because we have to, we have to, and sometimes while we're serving someone, we're doing it really begrudgingly. I've been on both sides of that. There's sometimes that you serve and you're doing a lot, but it doesn't feel like a lot. And then sometimes you might even be only doing a little, but that little bit is like grating on you. It feels so demanded or unfair or something about it. I want us to try to preserve this gift too. The gift of service is not enabling does not mean we just do everything for anyone at any time. Service is not just any time you help someone. The gift of service is when the Holy Spirit uses you to be like a foundation piece that someone can stand on, to steady someone, to support someone, to serve someone for their good so that they're not stumbling, so that they're not weak. You're a lifter. It's often a minimized gift. It's sort of like, oh, well, I just do this. You know, someone who maybe has a ministry of preparing the communion elements so that we can celebrate communion each month. Might say, well, I just go down and put you know, bread and juice in the cups and the dishes. There would be no communion celebration without you. You're a lifter. You're a supporter. You make the rest of the body function. You're the feet so that the rest of the body can stand. It's such an important gift. But usually people who have that servant's heart kind of downplay it for themselves. And often because it is service, it's behind the scenes so it doesn't get the recognition that it should. But we want to protect this gift this morning. We want to honor it. We want to honor the people who serve selflessly. And we want to do it right ourselves. We don't want to fall into the bitterness side of service. We want to be joyful in it. So we're going to talk about those things. And the way we're going to go about it is we're going to use a person as our illustration this morning. This is kind of a, a tradition of mine over the years that I enjoy. I look forward to it every Memorial Day Sunday. I like to take one famous Christian from the past and take a look at their life to be an example for us of what we can learn from them, what they did. We've looked at George Mueller in the past as an example of faith. And this morning, for the gift of service, I wanted us to look at five quotes from Mother Teresa, who served in India, who served the poor, who selflessly gave of herself 
for the benefit of others. She's a shining example of this sort of service. What would it look like if we looked like that? What sort of impact would it make on the world if we all in our places had that kind of ministry? It's a humble ministry. It meets needs, but it really is world changing. That's what you see in Jesus, a humble ministry in a certain place, but because it's a God thing, it really has branches. It spreads. That's the way the kingdom is supposed to work. And so what I've done for this morning is I've taken five quotes from her to be inspiration to us, from her thoughts to ours. And with each quote, I've found the place in Scripture where the Bible teaches the wisdom of what she's saying. We're going to go with those five quotes. You can look at the Scriptures that go with it. And at the very end, we'll tie it up by kind of some safeguards, things like bitterness, things we don't want to fall into, which are so easy with the gift of service. And so that's where we're going with our message this morning. We're going to let Mother Teresa be our example and learn from her and learn from Scripture. So for the first one, if you want to open up your Bibles, I think each, with each quote I'll have you flip to the Scripture so that you can look it up yourself while I read her quote. We're in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. Some of these Scriptures will be very familiar, um, but they're the foundation of everything else. If there aren't these Scriptures, nothing else works. That's the way it is with the gift of service. It's foundational. It has to work this way. So Proverbs, we're in the Old Testament, Psalms, Proverbs, uh, Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. This first quote actually is from Mother Teresa's mother. Her name was Drana. And um, it's a quote really that focuses on families. The five different quotes that I've chosen kind of hit different ones of us at different places, but this one is for you parents, for you teachers of Sunday school, for you disciplers, as we're mentoring younger children, um, to beg the question, what would it look like for us to raise Mother Teresa's? If our children grew up to be, how would we go about that? And this quote from her mother is very telling. It's part of what was formative for um, Mother Teresa. Her birth name was Agnes. So Adrana said to Agnes, my child, never eat a single mouthful unless you are sharing it with others. Never eat a single mouthful, so no meal, no snack, never eat a single mouthful without sharing it with others. Now, they were not wealthy. They were in a poor place themselves, but out of their poverty, they gave. Out of the place where they were, they did what they could. And it's, uh, the quote continues, when Agnes, uh, Mother Teresa's birth name, when she asked who the people eating with them were, her mother always responded, some of them are our relations, but all of them are our people. Some of them are our relations, but all of them are our people. She saw the people around her, whether family or neighbor, as her people. And so Mother Teresa was formed in a home culture where your meal is not your family time. It's not your private time. It's not your quiet time. It's a sharing time. It's a community time. It's a blessing to be shared. So people were constantly in. Known people, strangers, just people. Parents, can we have children grow up to be the next, another example of service in this way? We can. God can. Well, are we helping to train them in the same way Agnes's mother did? Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he or she is old, they will not depart from it. If we removed all the words that we talk to our kids with. <clears throat> what would they observe us doing? What would they learn from us? Are we sharers? Are we sacrificial? Are we isolated? Are we self-serving? Are we generous? These are things that have to be observed because we all know what we should be, but our children will watch us and will become little, little imitations of us. So we need to be doing these things as a family. If you read a Bible verse around the table, even if it's not every meal or some, it becomes part of what's normal. It's formative. Then you have a child that grows up and thinks, this is what is good. This is what is right. And they recognize that family revolves around Scripture as much as it does around food. These things are formative. Are we raising our children to be servants? Are we living as servants and letting them Watch us. I think this first quote is just powerful for parents. Uh, it's not from Mother Teresa herself. It's actually what helped to shape her. Parents, are we serving in that way? I 
felt many times, and this will tie into a later one, and I know I've heard from others here too, that especially when children are in the home, life seems busier than ever. So there's less time than ever. And so there's less availability. And to do something for someone else is actually then taking time away from family. So it feels like, well, I need to focus on my family to raise up my children. So I can't get involved in this ministry or that ministry or do this or do that. I would say two things to that when it comes to service. One is if your children are without you a certain night of the week, they're learning that that's normal and that's what people do. And they will grow up to be the kind of person that's out one night a week. And that's not too much to give. And it's teaching them the lesson that this is what we do versus just what we tell them to do. So show them. Be out one night a week. Sacrifice your time with them so you're teaching them the lesson. The second thing is you don't actually have to go out of the home to do this. This is someone sharing a meal. So sit around your own table. Do what you do but bring someone else into the mix. There are ways that we can raise up our children in this so effectively that it becomes normal. And what if this normal is contagious throughout our entire area and wherever our kids live, their communities? It's the power of humble service. And we love it in someone else. We need to be willing to live like it as well. All right, so that's our first one. The second one will have you turn almost to the end of your Bibles to 1 John chapter 3, right before Revelation there. John, Jude, and Revelation. So, 1 John, chapter 3, verse 16. 1 John 3, 16. This quote is from Mother Teresa, and she's speaking directly to fathers, but it applies to mothers, and actually we're going to expand it. It applies to family members. So, this could be brother to sister. Uh, it could be child to parent, how we relate to our parents. It's a family statement of how we love one another. Um, so we'll read her quote, we'll hear her quote, and then we'll read from 1 John 3, 16. She said, How do you know and love and serve God? How do you know and love and serve God? How do you prove that you love Him? In the family, the father proves his love by all that he does for his children, for his wife. We prove our love for Jesus by what we do and by who we are. Let me read it all together one more time. How do you know, love, and serve God? How do you prove that you love Him? In the family, the Father proves His love by all that He does for His children and for His wife. We prove our love for Jesus by what we do and by who we are. So by this measure, how well are we loving our family? Are we loving our children well by providing financially for them? Are we loving our aging parents well by providing guidance for them in decision making, by providing help for them if their health is not what it needs to be? Are we providing help for brothers and sisters who may live far away or who may live right next door when they need help with children or with decisions? Are we showing our love financially when someone in our family needs something? Are we quick to give it or are we slow to give it? Are we showing love by sharing heart? Do we talk about how much we love each other? Or is it just an unstated, silent assumption? Are we caring physically for each other? Are we caring emotionally? Do we share our hearts? Spiritually, are we talking about our faith? Or is it just something we know is there? Are we loving each other spiritually by having spiritual conversations? What does it look like to love? Do we love our sister? Do we love our brother? Do we love our mother? Do we love our father? Do we love our children? Do we love our nieces and nephews? If we don't ever show it, then by the standard of measurement, there's no love there. There's relation, but love needs to be measured by action, not just by words. So that's where we have the scripture that says exactly the same thing. This is a, a fact that we need to be reminded of again and again and again. 1 John 3, 16-18. By this we know love. So we understand it. We get it. We know love. That he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. It means for the family. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us love not in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. There are times not to give. 
There are times not to give. Someone asks for something and it's for the wrong thing. It's not the time to give. Someone asks for something that's going to harm them. You're going to be enabling them to harm themselves. That's not the time to give. You know, we give, what does it say? In deed and in truth. <laughs> There's got to be like a, a wisdom to our giving. It's not arbitrary. Don't stop at every person along the side of the street and give, not knowing where that money's going. But sometimes you should stop. And that's where the Holy Spirit turns this into a spiritual gift versus just a rule of thumb. We shouldn't have a rule for when you should give money to a homeless person. I give to every third homeless person I see. No. I give to two homeless people a month. No. You give when the Holy Spirit says, now is the time. This is the moment. Because that person God is looking to minister to and he put you there with the money in your pocket to be able to do it. And other times, it's not the right time. It's got to be a prayerful thing. There's no rule of thumb. It's just God's Spirit wanting to help. But sometimes what we think is help isn't. That's why it has to be prayerful. Word, in deed, and in truth. Not just with talk. If we were to measure ourselves by the standard of action, would we be called loving? Would I be called loving? Would you? Are we there for each other? Do we pick each other up? That's what the early church looked like. That's what the book of Acts looks like. That's what the family of God is always supposed to look like. All right, let's go to our third quote, and I'll have you turn to Psalm 68, verse 5. So we're back to the Old Testament. Psalm 68, 68, verse 5. And like I said, we have five of these quotes and scriptures, and then five ways to preserve the genuineness of this beautiful, beautiful gift. Psalm 68, 5. All right. Here's the third quote from someone who is a credible source on service. You know, it'd be like if someone who grew up in a, a wealthy family had all the comforts and all the, what's the right word, um, benefits and uh, opportunities. If they were to talk to us about sacrifice, they don't carry the same credibility, do they? It's like, well, that's easy for you to say, and it is. But when someone like Jesus talks to us about sacrifice, we have to believe it because he went all the way through, lived it out, died because of it, rose because of it. So he gets credibility. Mother Teresa is the same sort of way, right? She carries a certain credibility. If one of us in our very pampered existences say, oh, it's good to serve, then no, we're the ones that need to learn what it looks like to be sacrificial. We need to learn from someone who has walked that way. She is a wonderful example of this. So this third quote, she speaks to the needs of singles, the lonely, and the unwanted. It's very poignant. She said, we think sometimes that poverty is only being hungry or naked or homeless. But the poverty of being unwanted, unloved, and uncared for is the greatest poverty. We must start in our own homes to remedy this kind of this kind of poverty. We all know what it feels like to be in a crowd of people and to feel invisible. It happens in churches all the time. People will be gathering around and laughing and like joking and telling stories and like right next to them or right before or right in front, there's someone just sitting quietly, like excluded from conversation. It happens in homes all the time. You know, two or three talking and someone else just kind of sitting over here. Are we aware? Do we notice? Because if we don't notice, that's the problem. Because we're so caught up in just doing what we do, we're not recognizing the poverty of being unwanted that's right around us. It would be the same thing as standing next to a homeless per person just counting out hundreds, not even recognizing that they're standing there. You and your plenty, right next to someone not even being aware. We need to have our eyes opened to see the poverty of loneliness. It's a real thing. She says it's a greater poverty, and it must start in our homes. How many wives feel abandoned because of a husband's overwork? Many. How many husbands feel abandoned because of a wife's interests and distractions? You can be married, but it doesn't mean that you're noticed. And it doesn't mean that you're not lonely. We know this to be true. But this is what service and what love looks like. And it's where we should start. Start by recognizing 
the lonely person and going to them and saying, you, you're just sitting by yourself. How you doing? Connect. Just smile. Share. Talk. That's what friendship is. It's not difficult, but it needs us to recognize who the people are in our midst. And for every single parent that's in our midst, that's its own kind of isolation and its own kind of loneliness. Are we reaching out to those single mothers and single fathers to say, who have you talked to lately? Can I watch your kids so you could, like, I don't know, go have a coffee by yourself? Do you want to join us for a meal so you don't have to make one out of every single day of the year? Do we notice? Or are we so focused on ourselves and our own problems that we don't notice? Well, that's not what our faith is supposed to be. We're supposed to be looking out for others and for God first before our own needs. So it takes us opening our eyes and then connecting with the lonely. When we see our kids, are they just dismissed? You shoo your kids away too many times and they're just going to become isolated from you. And then when you want to connect with them, it's not ever going to happen. You've created a wall of your own devising. And then you wonder why it's there. It's that old Cats in the Cradle song. You, know, you, just, you say, no, 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 not now, not now. And then it becomes never. That's not what we want. Don't treat our kids like unwanted intrusions. They're our family. They're the next Mother Teresas of the world if we will raise them to love God and serve other people. But not if they grow up in a, a Christian house feeling isolated and lonely and unloved. That's going to be a person that never goes to church for the rest of their lives because they don't think it means anything. Love at home first. Loneliness is awful. And it's so easy to cure. We just have to do something about it. It's the poverty of singleness. The scripture here that we are going to read, Psalm 68, 5 and 6, talks about God's character. He is not oblivious. He is specifically the kind of God that cares about the disconnected people. You know, connect is the first thing we do. No one wants to hear all the things you know until they know that you are there with them and for them. Connect comes first and it takes effort. We have to step out of ourselves to become more like God. Psalm 68, 5 and 6. Father of the fatherless and protector of the widows is God in his holy habitation. God settles the solitary in a home, the homeless. He settles them in a home. He leads out the prisoners to prosperity. But the rebellious dwell in a parched land. God is a father of the fatherless. He cares about the fatherless. Do we? God is a protector of widows. Are we? God takes the homeless and puts them in homes. Do we? He leads prisoners out to prosperity. Do we? We want to be more like God. And if this is what God is and we have his spirit, he's going to want to do this stuff in us. We need to just be aware. We need to pray for this. We need to have eyes to see who are the lonely and who are the lost and what can we do to love them. We can't just sing songs about God being the father to the fatherless and never love a fatherless person. So this quote about proving through our actions is, or rather about the poverty of unwanted, unloved, and uncared for being the greatest poverty is critical for us speaks to the single person and whatever singleness they feel, whatever place of isolation they are. But Mother Teresa herself, before we go on to the next point, has to be an inspiration for our single people as well. If one woman with so little could do so much, then think about what all of us who are single could do with all the education we have, with all the time that we have, with all the money that we have, and with all the spiritual gifts we have at our disposal, and all our resources. Imagine what we could do Sometimes singleness, singleness is felt as this like halfway point or like unfulfilled something. And it's different, but this is a woman who did more with less than so many who have so much more. Let's be more like her and not be waiting to get something more so that we can do more. She needs to be an inspiration to singles, not just pointing out the importance of feeling love when we're lonely and being wanted no matter what, but not waiting for something more to do. Singles have more time, more availability to serve, and what if every single life looked like this? If every single man, if every single woman was like this? Without the demands of a family and the support of a family, if they were free to just love a family of lepers, 
to love the neighbor, to love the lost, to pour themselves into that, to adopt a community, to adopt a needy person. There's so much potential in singleness, and it, it does have its challenges. It is a challenge in many ways, but it's also an opportunity. I think Mother Teresa can inspire us in that way also. All right, our fourth quote, I'm going to have us turn to Mark chapter 8, verse 34. I'll turn there with you. Mark 8, 34. So we're in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark 8, chapter 8, verse 34. This fourth quote uh, speaks to so many of us who have worked hard to get where we are in life. College graduations, right? Higher education, uh, our jobs, our promotions. Many of us, most of us, maybe all of us, have worked really hard to get where we are. But sometimes that becomes our pride and joy. It becomes our focus. And her quote speaks to that. She says, at the end of life, we will not be judged by how many diplomas we have received, by how much money we have made, or by how many great things we have done. We'll be judged by what Jesus said. I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was homeless, and you took me in. So it's not that our jobs or things are bad. They're just relatively unimportant in the grand scheme comparatively to caring for people's needs, our jobs and our diplomas and our wealth are relatively unimportant. They're not zero important. They're not nothing. And they are things God has enabled us to do, so we don't need to degrade them. I and many of you worked so hard for the things that we've been able to do, but let's not then say we've achieved. We've succeeded because of that. We, like, achieved a good thing in the 5% importance that it has in the scheme of things. Good. But we can't think that we've arrived. We can't measure ourselves by that because Jesus isn't going to. And so if we spend too much time investing in things that are the 5% and then we get measured on the 95% and we haven't spent time investing in that, we don't do well in that test. We want to do well. So invest ourselves in the things that we work at and that we learn and we study good. But recognize that what God holds is important is something else. It's another thing. Make sure we're measuring ourselves by what he measures us by. Mark 8, 34 to 36. Jesus called to him the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his life? In the end, you just got the stuff or the degrees, but they're just a means to do. They're not the thing itself. It's like a stepping stool, and we get on it as if we've climbed Mount Everest. Like they're just to help you reach what you're supposed to reach and do what you're supposed to do. Let's not settle for the things of this life that are just temporary. Let's use the things of this life that we have, the jobs, the careers, the skills that we have, and use it to help people in practical ways, not just to like keep the machine running. Like our family has certain bills, so we got to make certain income, and we do certain things. So after a while, you're just working just to maintain. You just keep the machine going, and you don't even know why anymore, and you don't even think you like this machine. You'd totally like to trade it in at some point, but like it's rolling, and it can't crash, so we just go. Let's not get stuck there. It's not a machine. It's like step one. It's a stepping stool to something that we should be doing, people that we could be loving, good that we could be doing in the world. Let's not just settle. It's just a settling. It's not that it's not important. It's just so little ultimate value to things we spend so much of our time doing. Just be thinking about how you can flip those tables in any way possible and invest more time into the things that ultimately will matter and do what we need to just keep the machine running to provide for us so that we can do the things that will have eternal value. All right, we're at our final quote. I'll have us turn to uh, Mark chapter 4. So I'll stay in the Gospel of Mark. Just turn back a couple of pages to chapter 4, please. And let me read this final quote. This final quote speaks to all of us who are too busy. So it's not about achievement, it's not about family or singleness or any of this, it's about busyness. It speaks to all of us who don't feel adequate. 
It speaks to all of us who feel overwhelmed by so many needs that we're paralyzed into inaction. Here's the quote. It's simple. <laughs> I love it. She says, if you can't feed 100 people, then feed just one. I love that. If you can't feed 100 people, then feed just one. The word homeless is like this daunting word, but let's see if I can think of one. Stanley at the homeless ministry is one guy. Could care for him, could help him. All the homeless, we look at all the needs. I think with all of our communication these days, it opens our eyes so wide to so much need that we just feel like I'm dropping the barrel. But if everybody helped one person, kind of that old adage, what would it look like? So, okay, don't even set a standard that you need to do a lot. Is there one homeless person that you're caring for? Is there one disenfranchised, disconnected, single person that you're loving and adopting into your family? Is there one single parent that you're helping financially or with childcare? Is there one unsaved neighbor that you're just talking to about God and hoping that they're interested at some point? Is there one relative of yours that you're available to at the drop of a call any time of day or night because you know they just need help and they don't have it or can't do it. Pick one. Do one. Or do a hundred if you can. But if you can't feed a hundred people, then just feed one. That's the mentality of a Christian. You see a need in front of you and you meet that one need. And it ripples outward. We're not all supposed to do it all, but as a body collectively, we can do so much. So don't be daunted. Don't be overwhelmed by the busyness of life, by feeling like we don't have enough time to be able to do this. I want to be involved in missions because I love missions and I really want to help out with the youth group as it's growing because that's such an important thing. And I love to sing. Maybe I could join the music team and I love the homeless, so I'll go there on Saturday. Next thing you know, seven days a week, you're at church or in the community doing things and then your marriage falls apart and your kids hate you. Like, no, no. Don't be daunted by everything you could do. Hopefully you have more desires than things you can accomplish. That's a good sign. You see all the needs, but the Holy Spirit should say, here is where you can serve. Maybe for a year or for a season, you pick a certain ministry and you serve in it, and the next year, you serve in a different place. Maybe for a while, you adopt a single parent to help them, but then maybe God brings them a Christian spouse, and you can sort of hand off the reins and say, God's provided you with a helpmate. Call me if you need me, but the calls will be less and less because God's meeting that person's need. So for seasons, we do certain things. Elderly parents caring for them in our home. It's a season. Sometimes it's a short season, sometimes it's long. We're called to it for that time. Can you love one elderly parent? Sometimes it's tough to love even just one elderly parent, especially if they're living in your home. Okay. It was tough for Jesus to give up being God to become a man. It was tough for Jesus to sacrifice and to die a painful death on the cross. But it was for our good, and it was the right thing to do. It was God's will for our benefit, and he did it. And look what the result was. We can be that. So if you can't care for every elderly person, if you can't feed every homeless person, if you can't adopt every isolated and lonely person, find one. Just feed one. I'm going to paraphrase just for sake of time. This last scripture is in Mark 4. It's in 2 to 9 and then 14 to 20. God, or Jesus gives the parable of the sower and the seed and then he explains it. You can read it on your own. But to paraphrase it, we know that when God says, I love you, even though you're sinful and I want you in my family, so just repent and join, that gospel message, some people hear that and say, yeah, that's a certain kind of person. And Jesus recognizes that. He calls it hardened ground, too hard, no spiritual anything. And then there are others, when they hear that God loves them and they recognize there is sin in them and they want God to forgive them, they say, yeah, 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 yeah. And then 10 minutes later, it's something else. No roots, didn't survive. But there are others, and this is many of us in our kind of North American wealthy society that believe and are just like a plant that grows up in a weeded out garden, a weeded garden, a weed full garden, a crowded garden. There's no fruit, the flowers don't come out, the sun can't get in, and there's nothing that's produced from it. So we just grow choked out, 
And Mark says, you know, with the worries of life, anxiousness of wealth, that's a lot of us. The gift of service is the opposite of that. It's the last one where someone who says, God loves the world, so we're supposed to love the world, serve the world. And start with one person, serve the world. Some people hear that and they just go for it and they do it. That's Mother Teresa. She's the fourth kind. I want us to be the fourth kind of soil. Are you bearing any fruit? If there's some, could there be more? How do we look like she looked like? So to tie up all the things we said, I'm just going to say five kind of cautions, five ways that we can keep this service genuine. The first one is don't let bitterness or resentment rob your joy. Serve with patience or at least pray to be able to. Sometimes you don't have it in you, so pray to have it in you. Sometimes we don't want to serve, so pray to want to serve. Sometimes there's a first prayer that's needed. This last week, I had a few situations where I found myself in just these like trying situations and I didn't know what to do with it and my mind internally is like feeling the tug, the pull. Where do I want to be? Where am I? What needs to be done? What is getting done? What, just like the common experience that we have. And my prayer was, okay, God, how can in these moments I worship you? So I'm not just doing to do, doing everything as if worshiping the Lord. What does it look like to serve God with the daily things, like Brother Lawrence did? And we'll talk more about him another day. He'd be a great one to focus on. Actually, I think probably a year or two we did focus on him now that I recall. But bitterness or resentment forgets that what you're doing, you're doing for God. You think it's for people or you think it's for yourself. And if it is, you need to stop. Or if you can't stop, you need to pray that God changes it into a God thing. It's a worship thing. If you care for an elderly person in the home, every act of love is you worshiping God. That'll put joy into it because it's not an obligation. It's a joy to be able to serve. Don't fall for the lie that because service is behind the scenes, it is less important. It's not true. Nothing else happens if there's no foundation. If no one is to serve, no one can go. If no one is to serve, no one can stand. All the gifts are built on this foundation of humble service. This church is an example. Our families are examples. We are examples. People had to serve us for us to be where we are. So serve faithfully, knowing it is the most important. It was Jesus' most important quality, humble service, right? I wash your feet, and I want you to do what I have done because the greatest among you will be your servant. So service is Jesus' prime characteristic and his greatest command to us. It's not unimportant. It's not unnecessary. It's the most important. It makes everything else happen. The third one, don't avoid serving because it will cost you. The fact that it costs something shows that it's worth something. If you just only do whatever you want, that's not service. That's selfishness. That's you doing what you want. It has to cost you something. But pay it. Choose to pay because it's going to help someone. You have an opportunity to pay your time, to pay your heart, to pay your grieving even, or your frustration. You're paying in a cost that's sometimes like an internal cost. Pay it. Pay it to the Lord. Lay it at the altar like a sacrifice. Fourth one, don't look for credit or compliments. It's not service if you're looking to get paid. That's called work. You work and then you get what you're due. Not servanthood. Jesus is your reward. God will reward you. You're doing it for him. So if we're getting bitter because no one is noticing all the stuff that we're doing behind the scenes, it's not service. It's obligation. You have to reclaim that. You have to redeem that. You have to pray to turn it back into worship. Pray that it'll be service. And recognize you're kind of looking at yourself in the mirror right then. I'm not doing this for Jesus. I'm doing this because I want people to think well of me. I'm doing this because I think I'm a good person for helping. And then when they don't recognize it, I'm bitter about it. Can't look for compliments, otherwise it's work, it's not service. And the last one is, it's a choice. This is choice. So the minute it's forced, the minute it's compelled, you know, force our kids to do something, they don't have a servant's heart. <laughs> it's like trying to avoid a punishment or caving into a parent's demands. 
Service is a willing choice. Choose to serve. And then everything you do from that heart is exactly what Jesus did. Mother Teresa chose to serve and look at what God did with it. So, this is Mother Teresa, this is Jesus, this is us, this is the gift of service. I hope that something this morning has struck a nerve with us so that we'll walk out with more of a servant's heart than we walked in with. Music team, actually, I think it's just Andy, it's you and me, brother. If you'd come forward so we can close with song, let me say a quick prayer and then we'll close this morning. Father God, we thank you for your serving us, even though you are the great God, willing to serve and help us willingly, your choice, your decision for our benefit. Help us to be the same way. Help us to raise our children to be the same way and help us to love this world, this broken, failing world, with all the love that we have within us and with the love of your spirit. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.